you know we've because in the last 30 years how many thousands of complicated watches have been built tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands and who's going to be able to restore and repair and uh, and fix those in the future so this is why we need to uh, make sure we preserve those skills and it's through that exercise since the um, the actual kind of launch uh, and the takeoff of Naissance du Montre uh, 1 uh, where we actually saw that the collectors are also concerned and they're also prepared to, to support this kind of initiative. So it's a very interesting and very positive encouraging uh, side of it. Uh, Naissance du Montre 2 was interesting because when we when we showcased is that what this is? This is no no this is handmade no it's the QP it's handmade but uh, have you you've seen it I don't know if it's here actually is it but uh, oh, Naissance du Montre so Naissance du Montre one mm -hmm. uh, when we actually showed the first working prototype it wasn't finished there wasn't the finishing yet right. but it was actually working in a traditional handmade case um, that was the kind of moment when the project started to take off and people thought realize that we're losing these skills and we need to do something to slow that down and to try and uh, safeguard and transmit those skills and what was interesting was then it was uh, talking to Felix and uh, Martin from Urwerk that they'd been supporting uh, two guys working with them one of whom teaches part-time uh, who would, had been collecting machines for like the last 15-20 years but from more from the late 19th early 20th century and they'd actually got this workshop uh, put together where they could make all of the parts of the watch. So it was something quite complementary to Naissance du Montre 1, where the idea was the maximum mechanization was just an electric motor, and everything else had to be completely hand, uh, hand driven and hand commanded. Whereas the, these guys had a workshop with some semi-automatic uh, machines, but totally mechanical. So that was, uh, they, they, um, uh, put together to make their watch called Ossio. And um, and then we had this idea, so well, let's see if we can make a co-creation to raise the profile of the foundation, to support them a bit and give them a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of more exposure for what they want to try and do, make watches in this workshop uh, and raise some funds for the foundation as well. But the, I mean, the end game would be fantastic, it would be somebody who, who if we can get a sufficiently large resource to actually uh, have a kind of uh, kind of small school where we can actually add to the the different watchmaking school training which exist and to to add these skills to that so it would be a form of masters if you like. in a way yes yeah okay, mm -hmm. that's interesting. yeah i mean that would be the fantastic uh, yeah. thing okay. to be able to do so that you know i mean when, when you and I, uh, a few years ago, not so long, um, there, was, uh, there, was, there was this... He wasn't even born. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, but we, we went to Wastep, where there was uh, the course called the Complicated Watch Course. And so through the... It doesn't, it's been, it doesn't exist anymore, that course. And so there isn't a training like that anymore, really, out in the wide world. So this is, this is one of the things which would be which would be important to revive. You know, I mean, we're in a generation where be okay for the next uh, perhaps 15, 20 years. There are people with some of that know-how and so on, but um, you know, it's something we need to, that needs to be uh, uh, needs to have attention drawn to it. Uh, I think it, I think it's important for us. Um, of course, we could have a kind of watchmaker's view. Uh, but I think it's important to understand, you know, we couldn't really exist as independent watchmakers without the, the size and the, and the energy of the, of the wide, wider watch industry. So which, you know, it's a completely different uh, world to make uh, 10,000, 100,000 uh, movements or watches a year and to be able to offer those at, at a public price which is going to be uh, something which is reasonably accessible you know it's within the reach of quite a large uh, number of people and so this is something which is really essential these foundations and it provided all the basis of the skills in the in the past and this is where it's becoming more difficult with mechanization and more industrialization the the training 
that that industry needs must be done more quickly because we are always looking um, the government should spend less on training or that or it has to be compressed so you know these are just facts which are there so because of that pressure what do you take out of the training well you take out what people don't need in the industry largely and so you tend to lose or or thin out the the foundation skills and so um, and the industry because it's big it has its own particular problems and challenges you know from the outside we see these big numbers saying yeah the industry the Swiss watch industry is so rich but then you think about how many people uh, are working there and they have to you know have to, their livelihoods have to be assured and and it's and they're working in uh, an industrial context you're working in uh, you know the decimal point is way down way down way out to the left you know so uh, you're working in uh, fractions of a of a cent in terms of costings, so it's all it's all fairly tight. I mean, you know, um, but you know, we hope, of course, it's great, and we have one or two. Ex we have excellent contacts with some of the bigger, uh, with some bigger companies, and it's finding the right people because it's about people at the end of the day. In a similar way to watchmaking, it's about that contact, the connection, and and the the current which passes. And so, uh, you know, we're always optimistic. I mean, like, uh, like you said earlier, that um, often it's independents who, who make things move. Well, in a way, it's because we've got perhaps a, almost naive, a certain naivety. At the beginning, when we set out, we think, I'm going to make a watch that's like this and does this. Um, but that's actually super hard. And so you have that journey, like climbing a mountain where you think you can see the summit. But you, you kind of never see the summit. It's always uh, ahead of you. And, uh, and yet you continue because you're driven by a passion. And so that way you can do something which then inspires or alights people's curiosity or sparks a movement which hopefully will gather uh, speed and, um, and become something bigger.